I Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading the entire Bible together out loud and chapter by chapter. Today we're looking at Mark chapter 5. And this is a chapter that, you know, there's there's stuff in it that, that makes for an interesting story. Uh, you look at this, there's a there's a healing of a man who has an unclean spirit who's living out in the tombs, and it's very dramatic. There's a there's a whole herd of pigs that ends up falling off the cliff, right? Um, and, and then, of course, you've got the uh, healing of a woman and the raising of Jairus' daughter, which are really big miracles. But is this chapter just really big miracles, or is it trying to tell us something? I think that this is one where it might be that the miracles are so impressive that we might skip over the little details that Mark has deliberately put all over to try to tell us what it all means. So really cool stuff today, really good chapter to be looking at. And joining us today, we've got as our guest, we've got Pastor John Shank, pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwards Hill, Illinois. Good morning, brother. Good to have you back. Uh, yeah, this is a really cool chapter we're looking at today. It, it is. Thanks for for having me. Kind of a, a unique way to be on the the radio for me today, because normally <laughs> I, I live close enough to just be uh, in studio, but calling in right. and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, yeah, and it is a. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful chapter of uh, of God's grace. So we have lots, lots to talk about. Right. I I mean it's uh, <laughs> yeah. I was just I guess I was just re- like thinking about that. You usually are in the studio. I can I can hear your page flips on your Bible right uh, <laughs> in, the, in yeah. the background. Yeah. So it's a little little bit different. Um, I think mo- most of the guests are are remote, but but yeah. So th- w- welcome to everyone else's experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't get to I don't get to look across and get told that we've got one minute and two minutes <laughs> yeah. and all those things. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I'll I'll just, I'll just it's okay. I'll just I'll just belt that out over the air, so it's really obvious. So. <laughs> yeah, just cut but, me off. <laughs> but, yeah, good to good to good to be talking with you again, my friend. Um, all right. Well, let's. Uh, I do want to make sure we have plenty of time to get into this one today. So as we get started, would you open us up with a prayer, as you always do for us? Yes, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, you come to us. You have traveled and brought to us the gifts of the Incarnation. You have come to us to bring us unto yourself. Help us, O Lord, to see in this text the work of your Son, not only in the lives of these individuals, but also in our lives that Jesus Christ is not distant, but comes to bring healing, not only to our bodies, but body and soul, to heal us and to save us through his great sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, definitely the the healing of body and soul. It's uh, You, you get both in this chapter, um, if, if you're looking for it. Uh, I think that's a little bit of the, the key here. But Let's go ahead then, and without any further ado, just read the chapter here. Uh, we recall that the, the previous episode that we read was in chapter 4, the, the stilling, the calming of the storm. And so here they, they make it to the other side. They were going somewhere. They weren't just on the boat. They were trying to reach. This, this sounds like a, like a really poorly worded joke or something. They were trying to get to the other side, and so they make it in chapter 5, and this is what happens on the other side here. So here's Mark chapter 5 from the top. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerizines. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What's your name? He replied, My name is Legion for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs. Let us enter them. 
So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I... Touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they had said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talita kumi, which means, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. All right. So, I mean, it's just these these series of, of miracles right on top of each other. I mean, and in fact, you know, the the woman with the discharge of blood, it's right in the middle, right? It's like interrupting the sequence. So it just, yep. it just goes, you know, bang, bang, bang right here. Um, but there, there, there really are just so many little details that are, are, are way too easy to skip over. Um, I, I mean, we, we can, we can, I think just, is there before we get into like the specifics anything that kind of emerges to you like looking at the whole chapter like this that kind of uh, i don't know speaks to like a structure or kind of what might be going on in the kind of big picture i think big picture what we're seeing is is one um the the actual work and purpose of the incarnation being manifested in the lives of these three individuals but seeing it there shows us what what has Christ come to do? So he has taken on our flesh um, to bear with uh, our iniquities, our, our sins, and, and the fallenness of this world, which means that he's going to have to deal and, and overcome uh, the strong man and, and save us. So all these things, and then death itself, um, all these things are why Christ has taken on flesh and has come to be our Savior, 
then manifested in these three miracles. But really, what we can see is is our own needs, uh, the life of the church being manifested in these these uh, this one chapter too. How we all are brought to the faith, and then the 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 means of grace being uh, displayed here as well. So yeah, we have a, a lot a uh, lot to discuss if we want to. Yeah, I I think appreciate your your kind of summary there though. I I think that fear is really uh, the key. I mean, fear and faith is I think the the the, the key duality, and mm-hmm. I and I think that started already um, with the boat, right? Like what, when you when you go back to chapter four, it, it seems actually that um, that maybe chapter four should have started back with with the calming of the storm. Chapter five, rather, mm. uh, because there in that in that story, you got the same dynamic, right? He, Jesus asks, "Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith?" Right? right, and then here, right in this very chapter, the Lord again to the this time to the ruler of the synagogue says, "Do not fear, only believe." And uh, that's less clear to us, but of course that word. Uh, believe is that related to the word for faith, right? So it's again fear and faith, fear and faith, um, on either side. So, so I, I think then that kind of, uh, you know, like just what you were saying, you know, uh, how how we are brought to faith, do we react in fear, right? Like the, uh, uh, well, what we're going to talk about here, you know, like like the people from the country of the Gerizines who say like, whoa, whoa, Jesus, get out of here, right? We're scared, um, or like the the man who's healed who says please let me come with you right so i i do think that that actually that this fear and faith thing we're, we're actually getting a sermon here um in the midst of this um not it's not just a series of cool stories so right. I, I appreciate you bring, mentioning those two uh items in particular and all the crowds and even if you go back to the calming of the storm so the crowd yeah. of the disciples the crowd that reacts to the the healing of the man, uh, the crowd are, as the disciples and those around Jesus in the reaction to Jesus' comment, and the crowd around the daughter who laughs at Jesus, the crowds always react not in a faithful way, right? So, like you said, fear. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they're reacting not in faith. It's it's only by Christ's action that he brings uh, the individual into faith to believe in him and why he has come. So, um, and, and you see it with then the, the, he, the demon possessed man, then he is sent and he preaches and it's only in the preaching. It's not even in the miracle. It's the preaching that brings the crowd back to marveling and, and prayerfully back to, to faith in this Jesus. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's right. And, and in that way, I mean, it really does follow chapter four very naturally, uh, we were talking about that last time, how all those different parables, right, are all kind of on the same idea of, you know, it's the power of the word that's actually the thing that, that makes the the fruitful uh, harvest happen, that makes the growth happen. I, I mean, it's all external, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so in that, in that sense, too, right, like you've got the, the same sort of deal, you know, you've got um, really, and we, and we talked about this, how the this calming of the storm was kind of the real life application of it. So really, I mean, chapter five as a whole with the storm um, is the real life application of this, you know? So you've got parables about how God is growing his kingdom through the word of Christ. And well, here you go. Here are the real life stories of how God is growing the kingdom through the word of Christ. So, I mean, again, this, let's focus on, on the word from, from beginning to end. So, yeah, Let's, I mean, uh, if you uh, if you see yeah. the you know, like I, I I agree, it's really interesting to think about the end of four and just making that five. He says, "Be still, peace, be right. still," and it's and right. it's, it's the word. He he uh, gives the word uh, to the to the demon possessed man, and he is he's he's restored. It's the preaching of this man who Jesus sends out to preach in his name that brings. And really, then you would say, well, but then something breaks this, and it's the woman. She, He didn't hear her preaching. But no, the word came to her for her to know about this Jesus. It's Before she saw him, she believed in him because of the word. It's only by the word that she knew of this Jesus in whom she could come and touch. She believed in the word before she saw him. And that's, isn't that the church? Um, and then hmm. uh, the, the word of the Lord calling uh, this daughter 
uh, to rise again. Yeah, I, I really like what you were just saying about how, like, even the secondhand word is still the word, right? I mean, that's. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot there. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to have a little bit of patience, though. I'm, I'm gonna. <laughs> well, let's talk more about that in just a minute. But let's, so let's just start from the top here. Let's kind of zoom in and focus here. We've kind of identified these big thing uh, themes, so I think we're right right on the right track. But let, let's just kind of focus here on just this uh, this demon possessed man at the beginning, right? So uh, the first thing we're told is that um, he they, they wind up on the other side. Um, in the country of the Gerizines, okay, and that from the tombs, out of the tombs, there comes this man with an unclean spirit. So uh, this is a very particular setting. What are we supposed to be taking away from this? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I just, like I said at the, the beginning, that how we see the work of the Word now made flesh, well, where does he go? I mean, he knows... Jesus is on a mission, so he knows exactly why he is crossing over, and he knows exactly who he is coming to. And he, I mean, he knows all this of his uh, foreknowledge. Um, but uh, so he comes to this man, and he is demon possessed, and he is in uh, a graveyard, a tomb, um, tombs, right. and among the mountains. So it's he's in a desolate place. Uh, so definitely, when we see these words used in scripture. Um, you would be thinking of place of temptation, place of sin, place of wandering. You know, think about all those images of the Old Testament now brought forward. Now he's not, you know, he's not in the garden. He's outside of the garden, and the demons right. have control over him. That's definitely man in the fall. Um, and it is a real man. I, I don't mean to make it too allegorical or anything like this, but we should be seeing more than just one individual. We really should be seeing the struggle of humanity that Jesus comes and is um, here to rescue this man. And I, I don't know if we got into the verses that cover this yet, but um, where he, um, no one could bind him. No one had the strength to deal with him. Now, doesn't that speak of right. humanity's need for a Savior, that none of us could deal with this struggle against the demons, against their possession on our own, but we needed Jesus to come and, and rescue, that this man would break the chains that we would put on him. Um, but, but what did Christ talk about in the Gospels, that he has come to bind up the strong man and to plunder his house? Um, and that's the blessing that we have, that we are part, we right. are the spoils of uh, the Christ who comes in victory. So, um, and yeah, we see a yeah, lot no, of that, struggle in this man. Yeah, that, that's a really nice connection, right? Like you talk about, like, binding, like we saw earlier. And what was that, chapter 2, was it? Um, really early on. Um, and, and, of course, here, there's this, this man who no one can bind. Uh, I, I think that that's, uh, that's a legitimate connection to see, right? That as, as this man is in some ways finally set free um, because what's really binding him right is isn't isn't the people who are trying to like contain him physically but but the devils that have ensnared him right um, so that as he our Lord Jesus is setting this man free he is binding the strong man right so I mean that, that's a that's a nice kind of um, you know uh, kind of two sides of it way to look at it uh, the, the other thing that that I'm thinking about and, and I agree I, I think you can kind of I mean, everyone can kind of look at this and say, yeah, you know, we, we all can kind of identify and see ourselves in this. I, um, I, I, I agree, though, that this, this is one of these things where it's not like this is meant to be an allegory, right? Where this is like, oh, it didn't really happen. This is just kind of a, an inspiring story for your faith, right? Oh. Um, you, you know, kind of like, I mean, that's sort of the, uh, what is that? That's kind of like the summary of like the Book of Mormon, the musical, right? It's like, well, you know, it, the, so the stories, we don't know about historical reliability, but, you know, but hey, does it really matter? They're inspiring and they're real to me, right? Um, so spoiler alert, if you were going to see that musical, sorry. But um, yeah, <laughs> but like, you know, that's not what's going on here. This is one where it's a real life story and all the details are being chosen, right? To, to kind of bring out that extra meaning, right? Because like Mark could have told us a million different exorcism stories, right? right? He could have picked any one of a number of them, but he picked this one, right? And he told it this way. And, uh, you know, in, in the words of my PhD uh, father, it, 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 Mark is that good, 
you know, you don't don't downplay Mark's ability, right, to like convey this stuff in subtlety. So, um, and, and by the way, I, I know I've got some questions coming in on on email, and so we we will get there. Please please bear with us. But so on, on this last bit here, I was just going to say, I think the other way of taking this though is that you can really see this as identifying the Gentiles. I think in particular because the Gerizims, right? Um, this would have been a region that I mean, this is where Gentiles are, right? Um, this, this is not really like where you've got a lot of Hebrews hanging out. And more than that, right, just the idea that you've got this guy who's making his dwelling among the tombs. Um, and, and that, you know, uh, kind of going down a little bit more again, you know, what, what did we what did we see, right? Um, it says there in, what was it? It was uh, not just that he like came out of the tombs to meet him in verse 2, but in verse 3 it says he lived among the tombs. And that translation isn't even strong enough. Literally it says uh, who, uh, something like, you know, who uh, had as his dwelling, who had as his living place it, among the tombs. The idea as if like, this is like his permanent, like this is his address <laughs> is basically what it's saying, right? Like it's not that, that he just happens to be hanging out here because he's crazy. Um, th this is this is where he lives. This is this is his like proper place, which I, I think that that's like on the one hand, right? You're like uh, from the perspective of the Bible, you think to yourself, "Whoa, you know, like hanging out with you know dead bodies. That's uh, that's a no no. You, you can't be clean if you're doing that stuff, right?" You think of like you know purity laws and and, and so forth. So there's that. Um, so it's very like non Hebrew just in itself, but then also to that point of uh, kind of what you were speaking of, you know. Just the idea of you know kind of living in death, right? Um, that this is the state that that post fall uh, state, uh, but particularly the, the post fall state without the word of God, you know, without the instruction that was given through uh, Moses and the prophets. So uh, I think that with that with and some of the other details that follow, like you really see this as like this is a moment where Jesus our Lord is reaching out to the Gentiles specifically. Yeah, it's definitely the I believe the first time that he has entered into a gentle area and um and I, I you know as we as we hear about what happens i think that speaks speaks so much um so i don't i don't know how much time we have to to spend on each one of these but um as we get Yeah we have a couple minutes end, before the couple minutes before the break here so i mean maybe if like we can mention another detail or two maybe that that kind of uh, go along with that well, I, I would want us to see that after the demons are cast out, which right. what do they do? They go into the pigs and are drowned into yep. the sea. Then right. what what do we find? I mean, the, the herdsmen run away, so we see the fear of the crowds. The crowds don't get this. So then they come back seeking this Jesus and seeking what happened. What do they find? They find the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, now clothed and in his right mind. Um, so that's definitely um, a clear teaching and instruction of what happens for each and every one of us in baptism, where the old man mm. is drowned into the sea, uh, that the, the demons, and, and we do this at our congregation, we have uh, the Luther Rite, um, where we cast out uh, the unclean spirit, make room for the Holy Spirit, the first things mm -hmm. we're saying, and so the and then um, in the baptism where the old Adam is drowned and a new man is is brought up, and we are now no longer naked but clothed and in our right mind, not right. not in our fallen mind, but seeing Jesus for who He is. That that is really cool, and I think that we saw that in Revelation that when you have clothing explicitly mentioned yeah. in the okay. scriptures. You, you can't overestimate that. That that's not just a detail of like, oh, by the way, he was wearing a really nice looking <laughs> shirt, right? Um, yeah. There's there's more going on, and I and I think you're totally on the right track. Uh, we got a pause right here, but everybody, hang on. We're looking at Mark chapter five on Nice Strong Word, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you. 
touching the lives and the hearts of our listeners with the Word of Christ. Sharper iron is such an incredible, amazing gift. I thank you so much for what it's doing for me and what I know it must be doing for a lot of other people. God bless. To leave a message on the KFUO comment line, call 314-996-1542. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Worldwide KFUO. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10 states, If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. Find this true wisdom in Christ on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on Worldwide KFUO. Sharpen the iron of your faith together with two pastors as they take up the sword of the Spirit to proclaim the gifts of Christ crucified and risen for you. Hi, I'm Pastor Mark Hawkinson, host of Moments of Assurance here on Worldwide KFUO. On the next MOA weekend, I'll share thoughts with you about worry. What are you anxious about? Your health, your wealth, your job, your relationship? Jesus said, consider the ravens. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. So join me for a worry-free discussion on MOA weekend, 7.45 a.m. this Saturday and Sunday morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're looking at Mark chapter 5, this chapter that's full of miracles, but not just impressive sights and sounds, right? We're talking about some details that are pointing to a bigger picture. Even if you haven't had a legion of demons cast out of you, right? Even if you haven't had your daughter raised from the dead. Well, the thing is, what we're just talking about with our guest here, uh, these things are all pointing to things that we have had actually happen to us. It's the same tension of fear and faith throughout. Joining us today, we've got Pastor John Schenk at Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. For all of our live listeners, you've got an opportunity to join the conversation with your comments and questions. Give us a call, 1-800-730-2727, or if you're in St. Louis, you can call 314-821-0850, or as always, you can send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. Also want to make sure to thank our underwriters at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Thank you guys for underwriting Thy Strong Word. Their website is lhfmissions.org. All right, so right before the break, we were talking about, I really really liked the way you you put the details, right? You have a drowning, you have a casting out of a spirit, you've got a drowning, and then you've got a man who's clothed and in his right mind, right? I mean, that that just sounds very much like our baptismal liturgy. And uh, yeah, I wonder why we don't have, you know, the, it's interesting, you got that flood prayer in the baptismal liturgy, and right. it mentions a few different um, instances of biblical stories, you know, like the crossing of the Red Sea, drowning Pharaoh and his army and the rest, you know, but we don't put that one in there. Maybe we should. That would be a... Uh, it interesting. Would be appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. An interesting, interesting little parallel there. I, I think uh, also, you know, as, as you were speaking, you know, th- this really kind of popped out at me even more. Um, having just read Revelation, right? You talk about the sea, right? W- what what the sea represent every time in Revelation? The Gentiles, the nations, right? Um, yeah, no, the, the seas, right? Like the waters, right? Okay, that that's what God made. That was good, you know. But when it talked about the sea, like as in like the Mediterranean, <laughs> um, of course, this would be a different sea here. Uh, but the, the idea of the sea is right. This is like the the ups and downs and the waves and the being tossed about, like the chaos that is living among the nations. Um, so it's very interesting that you do have a herd of pigs. Okay, now there's another thing, right? You know you're not in Hebrew country now, right? They're keeping pigs, um, and they're, they're pigs that end up getting drowned in the sea. Um, and of course, you know, just the idea that these unclean spirits are bothering these pigs and possessing these pigs on some level, right? Um, that's kind of a... Uh, a little bit of a metaphor for what's been happening to the Gentiles all along, right? I mean, they're they're just being assaulted by legions of demons, um, but they don't have the light of God's truth to protect them, to to save them, to guide them. So, uh, I think that in in a lot of ways, this uh, these these details. I, I think uh, I really like the level you're bringing out. That in some ways we can relate to, uh, we all can relate. 
um, to these details. But on another level, it seems to really be highlighting something that's very Gentile specific that, you know, hey, Jesus Christ is for the Gentiles too. Um, and you get that, the, the last detail I'll mention here is um, down to the part about what the demon actually says, right? Uh, back in verse 7, he says, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Right? Um, and that's that's striking, because that's the first time that that phrase has occurred in the book of Mark. Um, we have had Son of God occur a couple times, uh, but here you got Son of the Most High God, you know, and you're thinking to yourself, what, is he— uh, is he trying to butter him up? You know, like he adds in the most high part, right? You know, is is this demon like giving glory to God? Um, <laughs> I don't think so. I, I think no. what's going on, and when you when you look at the construction in Greek too, uh, this is sort of the the plain Jane normal way that you would refer to the, the the singular monotheistic God of creation from the perspective of the Gentiles, right? This is exactly the way that they talked about God in Daniel, right, among with the Persians, right? The idea of, you know, in, in heaven most high, right, like in the highest, this idea that, well, there's lots of gods, of course, right, from a Gentile perspective. But here we're talking about this one in particular, right, the one who's with Mount Zion. So just, just even the way that the demon talks, it's like the guy may as well have been named, you know, like, I don't know, Gentile McGee or something, right? I mean, like the guy is just... He represents the Gentiles like in every way, and yet he receives healing. Yeah, and if you, you know, like to go along with what you're saying, it's not like this demon is keeping the second commandment. What what does he right. do right next? Right after that, he tries to use God's name to control Jesus. He demons don't yeah. they don't have everything, do they? And they don't, this is not an act of honor or faith or anything good. He tries to, you know, I adjure you, uh, in God, uh, by God, do not, like, who does he think he's, I mean, he says, who is he talking to, but he's trying to use God's name to control Jesus. So obviously there's a limitation. They will never speak rightly. And that's, I mean, it's helpful when Jesus you know, silences the demons so often from calling or speaking his name because they never say anything right. They're not going to give us the truth. And even here, it seems like at first they're speaking the truth, but for their own benefit. And so, right. um, no, we are, we are never benefited from, from listening uh, to to them, <laughs> only to Jesus. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, well said. And I, and I think that um, that's real, I like the way you're putting it, that, you know, this is a, a clear violation of how do you use God's name rightly. Not to try to tr- control God, not to try to tell him no. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting, this little, this little dialogue between them, right? Um, you know, because I, I was looking at this and I was wondering to myself, because, you know, the first thing that happens, right? So he, he comes before Jesus, he, he runs and he, and he falls down before him, right? Um, and, and so, you know, and it's, it's kind of weird, actually, that the English translation does this. It's the same word uh, that is translated worship in other places, but here it's just translated as fall down before him just because, well, it's a demon. So, uh, well, we don't want to say that he's worshiping, right? Um, right. But it, it's, it, I feel like that's kind of evidence how it really is kind of the, the same idea. It's, it's, it's the you're, same you're bowing idea down that every and, knee will bow before him. Yeah, that's too. right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. You're bending the knee. You're, you're, you're getting down before the guy. Um, you know, and we can talk about exactly what what you think you're bowing down to, right? right. Uh, but uh, it, the conversation that ensues, right? The first thing he's just like, you know, hey, like, um, you know, he, he, it's assuming this position, right, to try to get something out of him, like you were saying. But then it says, isn't this interesting? He says, I dream by God not to torment me. It says, for he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit, right? So like, what, what is that? Like, what is the picture here, right? So Jesus walks up to him and says, come out. And he keeps saying, like, come out, come out. So he's saying this, right? And and, and the demon's like, no, 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 I'm not going to. And, and then he, and he finally says, I jury by God, do not torment me. Like, what, what exactly is the picture here in this exchange? I think the picture is that the demon is being brought— whenever Jesus is present, he is—the he is there. The inbreaking of the eschaton is at hand. So the end times coming of Christ— 
it is coming in, in the work in ministry of Christ. So what will happen on the final day is that the demons are cast to, to the place of torment which was created for them. And so this demon knows what is to come, and in the person of Christ, he knows that, um, that, that at least he knows enough of this one is whom uh, he, he is required, there, he is compelled, uh, there is no abil- he has no ability not to bend the knee before of, not in, like we said, right. not in worship and praise and glory, but because of submission. That, That's right. That he has no other option. And now he knows that um, this one has come to conquer him. And so he is begging uh, it not to be today, and it is not today, and so they is cast out. Um, but even so... Um, you know, he, he doesn't really speak the truth in what his exchange is with Jesus uh, fully. Right. I don't think. Well, no, I, I totally think you're right that this is this is um, what you were saying, that he has no—he cannot resist Jesus. He has no power, right? I mean, that's, and that, I think it's very striking. We've seen that in Mark, that the first few chapters very focused on the authority of Jesus, Right. And in here, you see that there's a there's this powerful demon, right? Who no one can bind him, right? So I think that power and authority are here in the forefront. And Mark is not trying to say that Jesus is like saying, "Okay, come out," and 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 he can't get him out on the first try. So he has to keep repeating himself. I, I don't think that's the picture no. at all. I, I think that when you look specifically at the at the verbs of speaking, which all get translated the same way in English, but there's something different going on. Um, if you, you compare, for example, the, the verb of speaking in verse 7, it's different from the one that's in 8. I think what you have in 8 is, then Jesus is about to say, right, hey, come out of the man, right? And, and like, you know, he, he's opening his mouth, and the demon, like, knows, right? It's just what you're saying, right? He knows what's coming. He's like, oh, no, 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 wait, please, wait, please don't say that. Because as soon as you say that, I'm done, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's something like he was, like, about to say it. He was starting to say it. I think those are actually the nuances that you would expect from the form that you have there in Greek. And and then, you know, this the demon's like, oh, please, but just because as soon as you say the word, I am done for. And, then, and I think that, that we, we, we shouldn't miss that because this is, again, talking about the authoritative power of the word of Jesus, just like with that calm the storm and all the rest, right? This word that he has, no one can stop it. And and so the, the demon, all he's trying to do is get ahead of it. You know, please, oh, please just don't say that, because once you say it, it's game over. Right. And he's cast out into the abyss. I mean, he he's cast into the pigs, and the pigs uh, run into the abyss. I mean, if that's not a picture of the last day where every knee will bow, uh, yeah. and uh, the demons are cast to the abyss. I mean, we're we're kind of missing we're missing the point. <laughs> and right, uh, right. so now is the time for us not to align ourselves with a lie and a liar and a murderer, uh, but to align ourselves to submit ourselves to the one in whom is life and salvation. Right. Um, well, yeah. and speaking of that life and salvation, right? We should. I mean, we need to move on and talk about the yeah. other. Uh, two big instances, uh, the two big uh, s- scenarios here. But before we leave this, um, that salvation, that being in the right mind that you were talking about, right, that picture of, of uh, baptismal regeneration even, right? So the, the questions, some, some of the questions that we just got were, okay, you've got this, this guy who's sitting there, um, you know, clothed in his right mind. So some of the questions that came in over email were, so like, you know, how does faith put you in, in your right mind, and and what exactly is this state of being in your right mind? Right, is that like peace? Right, um, you know, is it something to do with um, understanding? Where like the understanding is what gives us peace, right? So, so kind of like how does that work um, in the context of uh, you know baptismal generation or sure. e- even us yeah. today? I think what we need to do keep like you keep saying baptismal regeneration. What do we have? So we, we are giving up our carnal mind, the fallen, fleshly mind, and what, what we have, and we see this so much in the New Testament, have the mind of Christ, have the mind of the Holy Spirit. You know, if we keep the mind of Christ, which is then enlightened by the gifts of the Spirit, then um, our, our minds, our thoughts, our hearts will be on heavenly things and on a, on a new city which is, is to come. So we, 
our right mind for us through baptism is a mind that's not focused on our carnal needs, our carnal desires, our fleshly, sinful uh, issues. Those things have we drown those things daily in the waters of our baptism, and what right. emerges is Christ, uh, and our lives that are definitely clothed and um, caught up in Him, so that our minds may be set on the things that are above, on Jesus his salvation, his mercy, his grace, and that as we go through our lives, that's our mindset towards our neighbor and love, uh, towards our daily vocations. Um, So, yeah, I would uh, point us in that direction. I think you're right on. I think that this, in some ways, I I think the, the thing about understanding, right, is important about having the right kind of knowledge, understanding things like the Incarnation. This is very important. And I think that we've seen that a little bit, especially in the, in the, in the parables, right? Like this idea that, you know, there's these kind of mysteries that, that, that you know, are, are spoken at first in, in code, right, in riddles, that there is no understanding and only by the explanation that the Lord Jesus gives that we come to understand them. So, that, I mean, that's there in the background, I think. But when you look at the specific words uh, the specific word in particular that's used here in, in Mark chapter five, um, it's this word that has more to do with what you were saying about like you were talking about like you know kind of carnal needs and desires and and what we're seeking after. It's about your alignment, right? So mind as in kind of your mind set, right, and, and not just uh, kind of your intellectual faculties, right? So I mean that that word there is this um it, it's this like si pronunta this um it's this word that's used uh it's used in the synoptics for the the same thing uh, but when you have it in paul right like what what is he talking about right he's talking about um you know like like have have this mind among yourselves right speaking of the idea of you know being self uh, sacrificial right um this idea of you know the mind of christ which is yours right this idea of being aligned with the spirit and not with the flesh. I mean, th- that's the way it's talked about here. So I think that, yeah, what, what you see here um, is that in, in baptism and in our regeneration, yes, of course, there's understanding and teaching that happens. But we're, we're put on a different team, right? We're, we're not, we're not uh, supporting the, the, same, the same way of looking at things, the same ideology, uh, and this guy here, they've seen him. This is a this is a total reversal. You've got like one of the big bad warriors who was on the other side of the battlefield, who's just hanging out in our camp now, right? I mean, so it's a switch of allegiance, I think, right? He's on the right side, which is <laughs> just as scary as anything. Yeah. Um, last thing then, just about this here, right? We talked about it a little bit at the beginning, right? So the fear and faith dynamic. You've got the demon that's uh, begging for mercy. Uh, and then you've got the people who come and they're begging to have Jesus leave um, the fear that grips them, right? So right. very interesting juxtaposition there they get in verse 17 about, I mean, I mean, really just asking Jesus to go away. Yeah, because the outpouring of power to the unbeliever, uh, which you see in miracles, right, is n- it's not always, it's not always going to be received um, in how we would think. We would think, oh, if I could just see his miracles, um, right. then I would believe and never doubt. In fact, right. if you look at the unbelieving response to miracles, it's to fall down and say, depart from me because I'm a sinner. And so that's what yeah. they're saying, depart from me. What they need to receive is not an outpouring of God's power. That's what you get on Sinai. What they right. need to receive is an outpouring of, of his grace and mercy, that's what you receive through the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, it's so well said. I mean, I, I would be lying if I said that, like, I hadn't thought that before, you know, like, oh, well, you know, if I could just see a miracle, right, see something supernatural, you know, then, right, then my faith would just really be stronger than ever. Right. And I would really, ha- I wouldn't have any doubts anymore, right? But, I, I mean, just, I mean, seriously, they get a miracle, and they're like, get out of here. So, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 no, no, it, it's not just about... It's about. It's not about just seeing the stuff. This is very much like what you had in the previous chapter. For those who have not, even what they have will be taken away, right? So, so these miracles, they actually make them worse off. They take away the little understanding that they have. 
So but then Jesus let, let's sends, tr- sends the word, right? Yeah, he no, does that's send them right. The, the word of to tell them, proclaim to them uh, mercy. That's right. And and uh, this is not the the last time we're going to see this either. We're going to get this later with the Syrophoenician woman here in Mark, where Mark, Mark is very deliberately included in these episodes where, yeah, you know, it seems that the Lord Jesus is on the way to go speak to, uh, you know, the children of Israel, fellow Hebrews, right? He's off on his way to go uh, up, up to the Decapolis, right, and uh, talk about, um, <clears throat> you know, so some of the people who, who are kind of like scattered out in that direction, right? Um, talk to the synagogue leaders and things like this. Uh, but on his way, he finds this Gentile, and we're going to see that again. But so in the next episode, right, I, I like this because this is getting to the point where you were saying where it's not about have you seen a miracle or not, right? Because you've got two people who now encounter Jesus, and you've got this one who's this synagogue ruler who's like, you know, it, it seems, right, like this this guy has not met him before, um, and, and or, or maybe seen anything firsthand, but he comes. It seems like he's he's heard of him, right? And, he, and he's confidently saying, "Here, look, uh, you know, my little daughter doesn't have much time left. It's a desperate situation. So where does he go? Right? There's a lot of places he could have gone, but he goes to Jesus uh, because he's so confident that this is the best shot that his little girl has. Uh, and then similarly, this this desperate woman who's had doctors do their things for years and years and years, and she says, "You know what? The one thing I I need, the one, my best shot." Is Jesus. So you've got these people who have this faith, this kind of faith unseeing, right? Who go to Jesus and say, look, I, I know that if I get to him, it's going to be okay. Absolutely. And if you take, so if we take the woman first as she comes in order here, so she's suffered under many physicians. So like, it's, she, it's not a, she receives her treatment. No, she's suffered under what yeah. they have done to her because they can't give her the healing, the saving that she needs. So as you said, she is unclean, flow of blood, 12 years. The suffering is immense. The isolation, the the distance from the ceremonial celebrations, all of these things for 12 years. And um, she hears of Jesus, and she comes to him. But what does she bring? She, she, said, she wants to, t- if I could just touch, you know, touch his uh, garments. Um, she brings nothing in her hands to Jesus. She has nothing to give to him. She, with an, with an empty hand, receives from the Lord what he has to give to her, and that's, that's life salvation. And, and in her instance, it's healing. Um, but we know that eventually everyone who receives these earthly healings will um, will. Get a, you know, will will die one day, but they receive something greater because they received a salvation in their Lord. Um, so she she definitely uh, shows me a lot about how faith comes. We come to the Lord with an empty hand and receive from Him healing and salvation. Right. I, I think that that's really. I, I think that's what we're supposed to be getting out of this, right? That it's. She she's not coming with with uh, faith, right? And it's like, oh well, she's got all this faith, right? And so, well, of course, you know, it's like if you give Jesus some faith, he'll give you a miracle. I, I think that's the exact opposite of, of what we're supposed to be taking away from this. And, and yet, we we can take it that way when when he says, right, daughter, your faith has made you well, right? right. It, it's not we so to, much that we have to then I, understand what faith is. So well, faith is right. something that exists in itself. Faith right. is trust, which trust always has to have an object. Faith also has an object exactly. of its of its devotion. So when he says your faith, well, your devotion to me, right? Your your trust in me because I am the one who has made you. I'm the right. one who has healed you, saved you. <laughs> you that's you. You put your trust in the right place. You put your devotion in the right place. You put your worship in the right place in Jesus. In the right place. In the in the right place, and I think that that's 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 exactly what we're supposed to be taking from this, right? In in, in chapter four, right, the question was, where's the, where does the word end up, right? In the in the right place, <laughs> uh, is it going to end up on on the you know rocky soil and the soil with the weeds and the thorns, right? Or is it going to be the the soil that's good? And so, really, when he says this, do not uh, rather when he says your faith has made you well, he may as well have said the word has made you well. I mean, because right. she's like you said, she's got to have faith in something, 
right? You don't just right. have faith like, oh, you've got, I've got, I've got faith and, you know, just, you, you got to have faith, you know, and we, there's that old song and it's just kind of a, like a positive plucky attitude or something like that. No, you got to have faith in something. At least that's what we're talking about when you're talking about the word in Greek, it, that, that believe, you got to believe something. And so it's the word that she heard about Jesus. And so lest we think that it's all about whether you touch him or not, like as if, as if that's the key thing, right? It's not that that's necessarily the key thing as much as it is because of the word that produced this faith. Well, then you can have this fruitful, abundant growth uh, in the soil of the heart. And, and I think that that's the, the same sort of thing. It's, it's done differently happens with Jairus's daughter where he's, he's heard this stuff. And, and I think your point about him bringing nothing is just even more exaggerated here mm -hmm. because the girl literally has nothing. She's dead, right? She's, she's not even reaching her hand out, trying to touch him. Yeah. The Jesus has to reach his hand out to her. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even before they get there, you know, the word of her condition comes and uh, Jesus word to his, to Jairus, do not fear, only believe, right? Believe, and again, believe what? Believe in me. Believe right. in Jesus. Yeah. That is really something, you know, do not fear, only believe. It, it's much, it's a lot like what he said to the disciples in their earlier chapter, right? So this, these are two nice bookends where he says, why are you afraid? Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? which is a, was a question, but it's kind of the same effect of, hey, stop being so afraid, believe. So it's, it's Jesus is the one who makes the, the belief happen, what we were just saying. It's the word, really, the authoritative, powerful word of Jesus that is the thing that's making the difference. And I think that the, the bit about him being laughed at is yeah. not so that we're, not, it's not to say that like, oh, well, man, it's so terrible how people made fun of him. Right, like no, no one played with him and had him in their reindeer games. That, that's not, I think, what we're supposed to be getting out of this. But rather, there are two different diagnoses here, right? Well, you've got the one of the world, uh, which looks at it and says, "If she's she's dead, why bother?" Right? There's nothing more that can be done. But then you got the diagnosis, the word of Jesus. She's just sleeping, and even though that seems patently wrong. The thing is, because of the word of Jesus, because Jesus' word is authoritative and powerful, if that's what he says the situation is, then that's what it is. Then death itself is just reduced to sleep because of his word. And and then of course, the word comes. Uh, you got that. It's said there in, 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 it's actually given to us in Aramaic, which is interesting. You just I, I feel like, again, emphasizing it's what comes out of his mouth. <laughs> it's his word that does this amen yeah his word actually calls her to arise and that is what's going to be said to us on the last day so as we dealt with the last day and the effect on the demons for those who believe the for those who are longing for his appearance right little girl i say to you arise and our tombs will be empty all right a a amen she was 12 years of age 12 the number of all God's people. Thank you so much, brother. Fun, fun chapter to be looking at. Thank you for just drawing out all those uh, those details for us that point us to salvation for the Gentiles and for all. And God bless your Easter season. Looking forward to talking to you again soon. God's peace. Everybody, that was Pastor John Shank, pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. Moving on to Mark 6. Till then, Pastor A.J. Espinosa. Peace. You've been listening to Thy Strong Word, produced by the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate Office of National Mission in cooperation with Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the LCMS. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at KFUO.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.